Dit is dinsdag 16 april 2024 en tijd om te kleed. Maak die offer natuurlijk bekende journalist en schrijver. Uh, Zij is in ons onderhoud vandaag hier in Marie van der Wald. Zelfs met haar oor haar jongste pennevrug bly geris ingeskakel daarvoor. Natuurlijk wens daar ook kort inzetsel van Agri Monitor en wat ze landbouw spuise jy vanavond in die program kan verwaag. Ons is nou terug met een kort nieuwsgesprek. Attention kids, we have some exciting news for you. We are back and this year we are planning on going big. So listen up. If you are in grade 3, grade 2, grade 1 or pre-primary, we are bringing your free school workbooks to you soon. This is all you need to know about where you can find your books. Books will be available for free in Ripper Buchanan Street Sale newspapers and all Namibian Sun newspapers. And for all pre-primary kids out there, your books will be delivered to your school in all 14 regions of Namibia. And there's more. Pre-primary books will also be printed in nine different languages. Check out when your book will be available for the schedule right here. That's not all. Our free online school is there to help you along the way with video lessons and more books to download. You can also follow along on NTV every Monday to Friday from 9.30 to 11.30 for your daily online school lesson. We thank all our sponsors who are helping to build a brighter future for Namibia. Contact us at info at acdtrust.com and follow us on Instagram. Landbouw, dame Francie Steinberg, kijken. Slag vandaag. Hoe komt zij hier? Is eindelijk die die lijberig gaan weer een hoofdzaak, maar het gaan hier weer uh, via een wildsmisdaad. So, wat iets bij belangrijk ook is voor ons kijkers. Boeren is moedeloos weer voortdurende via diefstal in wildstroeperij. In dit nog met die droogte. So, gister was een blije dag voor die boeren. Die boeren het omtrent opgeruk naar die Windhoek Landroshof voor die verschijning van Derek Brokkerhof. Nou, hij is gloe een ou kalant. In sy sake strek van van oos na wees in die naam op nakloof by sea eyes, um, swak op moend, walvis baai en hy het nou al glo iets soos zebras um, Vijf slag osse in die, in, die, in die kommas hoogland, dit hou net nie op nie. En hy is al op, op twee sake in 2016 en in 2023 is hy skuldig bevind. Maar hy loop lekker los en gaan glo net aan om hierdie misdade te pleeg. En dit is hoekom die Namibie Landbouw en nie en al hierdie boere nou opgeruk het om borgtocht teens te staan. So Landros, Monika Anjaba het alles in aanmerking geneem, daar is nog 7, omtrent 7 hangende sake teen om en um, sy het borgtocht op gronde hiervan geweier. Ook baie interessant, die oud politie hoof van die dwelm eenheid, um, Hermie Commissaris Hermie van Sel was ook daar om die boere bij te staan. En hij sê, hy onthou goed toe hy op Arandes vir hom in hechtenis geneem het op een klag van kokaïnsmokkelarij. Ja, is die saak nou ingereken by hierdie hangende saak? Dit is ook nog een hangende dat... saak, ja. En elke keer kry jy net makkelijk borgtocht en dis hoe die boere voel, dan, dan gaan hy maar net voort met om hierdie misdade te pleeg. En hy is nie die enigste veedief of vermeende veedief of wildstroper wat dit doen nie. Dit is een probleem vir die boere dat by die hoofe kry hierdie mense makkelijk borgtocht en hulle pleeg weer hierdie misdaad. Dit is ook om dit so belangrijk is dat hulle opgeruk het. Hoeveel mense was daar wat protest kom aanteken? Hulle het nie rechtig protest aangeteken nie. Hulle het met die staatsanklaar gepraat en die, die hangende sake, een lijst van die hangende sake gewys. So dit was nie een protest op toch nie. Dit was meer van een samenwerkingsoorinkomst. So dit was baie beskaaf. 
Maar wat daar maar groter groep? Ja, wat. Nee, nee, dit was, ja. daar was heel wat boeren, daar was politielede, daar was biertwachtlede, ook van, van Rioboot, het um, vier diefstal eenheid, want ons weet hoe gaan het hmm. daar ook, dit gaan maar rof daar ook, hulle was ook teenwoordig, ja. En die jongste voorval sommer hier op die stadse drimpel geweest. Lekker hier achter in Eros. Een <laughs> koedoe en een geemspok. <laughs> en dis dier een beerdwaglid raak gesien, een bekende beerdwaglid van Eros. En hy die sekuriteitsdienste laat weet en um, hulle, hulle twee, die twee beskuldigde, dit is nou uh, Derek Brokkerhoff en Marcus Roy Nasi, sy mede beskuldigde is toen nou betrapt daar met die karkasse en een voertuig en een um, jaggeweer. Een ander kopseer bly maar altyd in Holsterstroperij, ons het nou groot toename hierdie jaar dus ver in en die getalle gesien, maar daar is ook iets niets. Daar, daar is ook iets niets, ons staan tot dusver van jaar op 30, daar was weer een strooprijgeval in Itosha Nationale Park in die noorde, um, so dit is nou 21 renosters gestroop in Itosha Nationale Park, uh, en hierdie is twee zwarte renosters, een uh, koei en een balkalf, en die hoorings is, is afgekap, dit is gevind, en ook twee verdachtes, ek volg die saak vandag op, hulle verskyn in die Shumep Landroshof, en volgens die politie is daar nog twee verdachtes, hulle is glo warm op hulle spoor, so ons hoop vir die beste. Dankie Frans Wies, Dankie Dani, kom ons kyk na vandagse spotprint. Hier is jou weer voor uitzichte vir woensdag 17 april 2024. Die hoofdcentra in Namibie. Kom ons begin daar rechts, bo, centraal noordelike Namibie. Soem op 19 grade, die minimum, die kook sal daar draai op 32 grade, ook 32 op Oshivarangu. 17 daar uh, vannacht die hoofdstad 13 met een maximum van 29, 32 in die ooste, daar in die verre noorde wissel dit tussen 36 en 33 grade op Katima Mulilu. Aan die Namibiese kus, ons het om nou daar, ja, wel was baie 14 met een maximum van 25 oranje moed, rechts onder ook aan die kus natuurlijk 13 met 23 Ketmans Hoop 30 en Aranos 32 en Arjams Vlei 16 grade, vannacht moet een maximum van 30. Vandag in Ankeri Monitor, boere staan midde die droogte letterlik voor twee dere wat invoer en uitvoer betref. Aan die een kant word daar gesikkel om reevoer vanaf Zuid-Afrika in te voer en aan die ander kant is daar nieuwe regulaties vir vee uitvoer na die bierland. Dit raak vir al die speenkalf bedrijf. Hier die materials is volgens die landbouwproducente organisatie eensuidig dier die Zuid-Afrikaanse overhede aangekondig, sonder enige consultatie met belanghebbendes. Insluitend die Namibiese overhede. Namibie het dus geen ander kese as om tans aan hierdie vereistes van die invoerland te voldoen nie. Landbouwkenner Wally Roo beaam dat die huidige maatreels dier Zuid-Afrika gestoomroller is, soos met al vorige speenkalf invoer vereistes. Die landbouwministerie het die Rundo abattoir aan Mietkou oorhandig en vlees van noordelike kommunale gebiede is bijna gereed om na Qatar uitgevoerd te word. En op die toerismefront het die Onguma Tented Camp in die Onguma Wildreservaat langs die Itosha Nationale Park is splinter nieuwe baaikie aangetrek. 
Ons speel uit met een video van Agribank. Um, farming is a business, so to expand it, uh, take it to a next level, yeah, and uh, just to grow the operation, yeah, it, that will be, that's, that's the vision. If you have an idea, go for it, yeah, and if you have an idea in farming, go for it, yeah. So, and, and, and there's institutions like Agribank who can assist you to realize that concept of yours. So, so if you just go for it, yeah, that's, that's, that's the message, yeah. And uh, the loans are there, the, especially like the different products that, that Agribank offers um, for youth, for uh, um, empowerment, affirmative action, those kind of loans are there, yeah. So it's all up to you um, to implement if you have an idea, yeah. The youth, um, usually farming is seen as an is a sector which are many people are not seeing the value of it. Yeah, and um, I will really encourage, uh, especially the youth. It's something you can make a living out of. Yeah, so consider it <laughs> going into farming. As jy liefhebber is van mysterieuse novelle is uh, Maggie Of, het skryf het ook net vir jou en dalk het jy al een paar keer van haar boeken gelees. Maggie Of het nou saam met ons in die atelier om te gesels oor haar nietste boek, nie a murder mystery wat gewoonlik het op en uitkom nie, Love and Fury, dit is haar eie memoir wat sy geskryf het. Maggie, how are you doing? I'm very, ek is baie blij om hier te wees. Ek sal my bykie Afrikaans probeer en dan sal dit uitpieter. Ek weet nie wat is die Afrikaanse woord. No, we can proceed in English. So, Love and Fury, your memoir, I think there's really no point in, you know, discussing what is written in the book. I think our viewers will have to read for themselves and see for themselves what's contained in the book. But you explained at the Namibian launch of Love and Fury that this book was a way of resolving certain things that you didn't have answers for. Um, what, what were those things? And do you find you that this book, writing this book and putting it out, gave you answers to anything? It gave me some answers. It gave me many new questions. Mm -hmm. I have to just say that. So I start the memoir at um, this point in my life where I'd really hit a crisis and I was really having, I just couldn't find a way to go on, um, lit quite literally. And so many things had sort of broken. A very long marriage had ended. I couldn't write. Um, but I just didn't know how to be. And it was my creativity and my writing, actually, which I think is inside every person, inside every woman. It's like how you make yourself in the world. Kind of get, kept me going to work out what had happened, what I'd been carrying for so long that it had sort of rendered me speechless. So it was kind of writing a into that silence of that crisis, like a real yeah. crisis in my life. And I had to examine where I'd come from, who I was, why I couldn't do anything anymore. And obviously it's worked, I'm still alive, and here I am, and here's this book, and here yes. I am sitting in the studio of a country that shaped me, really. Yeah. So yes, I've answered many questions for myself, and from the response I've had from readers, it seems like, many women and so many men. I've had so yeah. many men write to me, say, okay, you've explained mm -hmm. something about women, about the women that we love, mm -hmm. that we live with, etc." So I think so, but it's given me new questions, so <laughs> luckily. More questions to answer. Yes, I'm looking more, forward to yeah. the next book. Okay, so um, you, you speak about going between different cities and how these different cities have shaped you, how your children have shaped you, how largely men have shaped you, um, especially you, again, at the book launch mentioned, you know, writing about women is writing about men mm -hmm. due to this kind of patriarchal system. Um, but you also said that at the same time that you are a feminist, and I think by that virtue you're a feminist writer as well, and you touch on feminist topics a lot, um, by that virtue um, you, you're supposed to hate men, really, is, is the world view. But you say that you don't hate men, you don't think men are villains, um, and you don't think they're born as villains, but how do you find that balance between the feminist mm. side that wants to tell you that men are bad and that part that says that men are not born bad, they are created to be bad. 
plenty of men are villainous. Let me put it like that. Um, yes, I'm absolutely feminist. I think any girl is kind of, you're kind of born a feminist. You have to be a champion for yourself. There's a great deal of, I would call it propaganda, as if the politics of advocating for equality, for rights, for fairness, for the um, ability to go walk through your day without being assaulted, without being denigrated, without being humiliated, is somehow a radical act. It's not. Um, the thing I can't bear is misogyny, which is the hatred of women, which mm -hmm. most of us, all of us who live in a patriarchal system, we know that. So we've experienced it. So men and women are arranged or made into particular people, into particular roles. Mm -hmm. uh, the one of talking and mansplaining, which is <laughs> given to men. Women are meant to be quiet and listen. Yeah. You go mad if you listen all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your right to speak is shut off. It's cut off. Mm -hmm. We live in a, Namibia as a country like South Africa with extreme levels of violence against yeah. women. We don't have to put up with that. On the other hand, patriarchy is a system like apartheid was, which is a construction around political beliefs. Mm -hmm. It's not innate. You're not born um, knowing how to be a man, how to be a woman. You're educated into those things. So I've written a great deal about violence against women. And you say, yeah, correctly, in a way that's writing about men, that's understanding what is this system of silencing oppression of murder of um erasing what women have to say mm -hmm. and of course it erases what half of what men have to say there's a wonderful chinese proverb which is women hold up half the sky you have an imbalance mm -hmm. without the two in an equal setting an equal position um so I think a lot of it was kind of trying to understand that in myself and this conflict between thinking I could do anything, like poor little boys are told they could do anything, and the massive shock when I reached puberty, 12, 13, where you suddenly start to look female and the, and the, the shock of realizing that the people outside of me, usually men, women too, had a totally different perception of what I was meant to do. I describe in this book a kind of an assault by a teacher, which I would imagine so many women and girls listening will have had a spectrum of that, where yeah. suddenly you're perceived to be different. That was the, his case. It was not to do with me. Yeah. So in some ways, this book is pushing that back and claiming women's place back mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So... We, we touched earlier on the different cities, and obviously one of them is Vintuk. You, you have a whole section of your book dedicated to your life in Namibia, um, your life as a housewife, how you went into publishing to sort of escape that. Um, you know, do, being back in Vintuk, obviously you've been back multiple times now. Do you view that version of Margie and remember her differently than you think it felt at the mo in the moment? Yes, there's a big difference. I, I, my parents moved here in 1972 mm -hmm. and then I was at school and coming back and forth. But then I moved here in 1990 with my first baby just after independence and I'd come from London. So I have been a bit of a vagrant. I still am. Um, and that period was so formative. It was just wonderful. Namibia, you know, anyone who's watching who remembers that time, it was such a joyful release. It was the end of that mm -hmm. ghastly war. Um, and there was this feeling of hope and potential, which I felt as well, you know, mm -hmm. young mother, I was 24, 25. Um, and so there was all of that going on, but I was, I had no idea really how to be a woman who was working and looking after children. I, I, I w it was so conditioned into me, this role of a, of a wife and a mother that even though I'd been an absolute feminist at university, it was all here in my thought. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do it with my body. I also think I had some quite bad postnatal depression. I de suffered from, I didn't have the language for it then, from depression from before. I had mm -hmm. trouble eating, you know, with eating disorders, all sorts of very classic feminine psychological symptoms 
of living in a world that was hostile to me. So my solution then at that stage was to go out and find the work that I wanted to do. And Jane Kachavivi had started New Namibia Books and I just knew that that's where I needed to be. Mm. I made her give me a job. <laughs> and that, that formative experience I had in Namibia, which offered me these wonderful opportunities and enabling and creative work was the scaffold of all the work that I've done. Mm -hmm. It's all built on those nine, ten years that I, you know, from the whole of the 90s. I left in 99 because I had a scholarship. It was the bedrock and I think I discovered then, working with a friend of mine, Ellen Namila, on her memoir, mm -hmm. um, The Price of Freedom, that a woman giving an account of her life is a political act. Politics with a small p, but because women's experience is marginalized from the mainstream, a woman accounting for herself and mm -hmm. making society account for itself mm -hmm. is a very necessary form of politics. So in a way, working with Ellen and then 30 years later, 25 years later, coming back to my own life, it was a kind of m reconnection mm -hmm. of that very energetic but also confused young woman that I was. Mm -hmm. But I was full of fire, <laughs> full of fire. I was going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is obviously something you, you touch on as well in, in Love and Fury. And one thing that for me reading Love and Fury um, was, was very unique to see, again, that, that idea that writing about women is writing about men and it equates to writing about men in some capacity. Um, but if you really look at the golden thread through Love and Fury, it is women. It's mm. the, the birth of your daughters. It starts with um, how your daughters came into life, um, moves into your relationship with your mother, moves into your relationship with your sister Mel, um, and their relation to men. So truly it tells the patriarchy from their point of view and how women hold themselves together outside of the patriarchy. Um, do you think that your views of the role that women have to play in the patriarchy have changed in sort of working through love and fear? Through all of this. Um, yeah, I mean, women have kind of kept me going. Friendships, the, my family connections, especially mm -hmm. my daughters. And um, because despite all my war on domesticity, I absolutely loved being pregnant and giving birth to my children. But I found the role that is allocated to mothers was so pale pink and saccharine and nothing to do with how I felt about it and nothing to do with my intellect. You know what I mean? There's yeah. an idea that if you have children, you kind of, your mind disappears. It really doesn't. Yeah. It gets much sharper. I mean, my politics have got more radical as I've got older because I see the world that the women I love, the younger women I love and care about have to be in. And it's, there's a massive backlash. Mm -hmm. All over the world, you look in the US, in, in parts of Europe, this backlash against feminism, which is just saying we want equality and we want to be able to walk down the streets by ourselves and be safe in our homes, etc. So I think that it's a portrait of a, a society, but one of the things which has been important to me is this question, you were telling me earlier you do some sports reporting. <laughs> Men male writers or male sportsmen can stand in for the whole community, the whole mm -hmm. society. A woman somehow is always presumed to be only speaking for herself, but we aren't. We're speaking for everybody. We can stand in for the society uh, that we are and reflect how it is and tell everybody's story. That was one of the, um, I think, important things for me. So you tell your own story very specifically I said at the launch, I see this book as a way of inviting people into the mm -hmm. house of myself. Yeah. And the laws of hospitality apply. Everybody is welcome and everyone can leave intact, but, but maybe knowing and understanding a little bit more about themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's the writers I've read have enabled me to understand more about myself because they've understood their own society. It's like that classic yeah. thing with therapy. If you know and understand your own emotions, mm -hmm. you can contain and understand the emotions of others. Mm -hmm. It was the law of motherhood. You can calm a baby if you know yourself. You can calm yourself, you can calm the child. It's very yeah. similar.
Okay, fantastic. So a house for people to be invited in. I think um, I, I felt very at home in Love and Fury. I was just telling uh, Margie before we started this interview that it, it felt like a safe space for a younger version of me, the current version of me and the future version of me. So whichever version of me you may be, uh, be sure to check out Love and Fury by Margie Orford, a fantastic read. Um, I went through it in about a day and a half. <laughs> I see if you can beat me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank Margie. you. It's fantastic and to have you. Yeah, and thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Dit was die skryver Maggie Offerd. Haar uh, nieuwe boek Love and Fury is nou oral in elke boekwinkel wat jy kan uitsnuf beskikbaar. Sluit morgen weer by ons aan en onthou, klet saam op al ons platforms. Tot ziens.